Hi, this is Miss Litton, and this is my wonderful zero period class. Say hi. Hi. All right. So we're focusing on the vertebrate nervous system, and this picture in your book is a great picture because it breaks everything down. In orange at the top, you have the central nervous system, which consists of only two things, the brain and the spinal cord. Everything outside of that is called the peripheral nervous system. Good. So when you look right here, you have cranial nerves and spinal nerves. You have 12 pairs of cranial nerves and you have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And whenever you have a nerve, those are just long axons and they can be sensory or they can be motor or they can be mixed, which means you could have a nerve that has a bunch of axons only going towards the central nervous system. And if they were only going towards the central nervous system, what kind of neuron would that be? Sensory. And if it was only going away, they would only be motor. But if they had fibers going both ways, then it would be mixed. Does that make sense? Okay. And the 31 pairs coming off the spine, they are all mixed. The ones coming off the um, cranium, some are sensory, some are motor, and some are mixed. Okay. So this just says sensory and motor fibers. Now, of your motor, okay, at, when you're sending information out, you can send it to a couple of places. It says somatic and autonomic nervous system. When you hear the words autonomic in your mind, you're gonna be thinking automatic. You don't even have to think about it. Somatic though is about choice. So your somatic nervous system is gonna to go to your skeletal muscles because you're choosing to move those. Autonomic, you can divide this up into parasympathetic and sympathetic, and, and this is why, okay? Sometimes you want your heart to beat faster, like if you were gonna be in a soccer game or something like that. If you wanted your heart, I know, stranger danger. Do we know who that is? Uh, oh, she does? How do you know that? Are you being prejudiced? She looks like a Yorkie. Okay, um, um, I need a booze kit. Um, so somatic nerve, and a person. Um, somat, um, Somatic, when you don't think about to our skeletal, but something to our heart, sometimes you want your heart to beat faster. That would be your sympathetic nervous system would speed it up. Parasympathetic would not, okay? Mm -hmm. um, if you're in, um, if you are gonna go to practice, are you gonna be worried about digesting your food? No, okay? So um, when you have something that's about relaxing or chilling, um, that's parasympathetic, okay, just chilling. Sympathetic, um, this is under some sort of stress. It doesn't mean it's bad stress. It could be a stress of a workout. So parasympathetic, you would start the digestive process when you're chilling. When you're not, when you're gonna go work out, you're gonna make your eyes dilate, you're gonna focus your energy on your skeletal muscles so you can work and run faster. So those are the two divisions of the autonomic that you don't even think about that's maintained for you. If you started, if you needed to breathe faster, who in our brain tells us our breathing rate? You know this. The medulla, medulla oblongata. So it would speed up our breathing rate using nerves, sympathetic nerves, to speed it up. Yes? Would autonomic also include like muscles that are voluntary so you can't control with your breathing? Or yeah, anything like that. Stuff. Right. Now, sometimes, we're, and we're going to talk about reflexes. It's like you're not consciously thinking, if somebody threw something at you, you're not like consciously thinking on your reaction. It just happens for you even though you're using your skeletal muscles, right? So that any kind of reflex like that, even using our skeletal muscles, would still be part of our autonomic nervous system. And truth be told, everything's a reflex, okay? Inside, internally, you're maintaining your body temperature, maintaining your heart rate, maintaining your breathing rate. Those are all reflexes, unconscious things that are just being done for you. Okay. All right, so that's the overview of it. We're gonna focus on the central nervous system first, just your brain and your spinal cord. And let's take a close up of our brain. And on your notes, where it says central nervous system introduction, function, we have sensory information received, motor controls initiated, the meninges are protective membranes around the CNS. Protective membranes around the CNS. So you actually have three protective membranes. 
the pia is closest to your cerebrum. Then you have your arachnoid, kind of looks like spidery. And then your dura, very durable on the outside. And that always cracks me up because P-A-D spells pad, like patty. You don't have to memorize all those. I just thought I'd mention that, okay? Um, and then your cerebral spinal fluid fills the spaces and cushions and protects the CNS. Cushions and protects your CNS. Fluid around there. Okay, here is, a, we're focusing now on the spinal cord. This would be if somebody was laying down like this, and then they just chopped them, and then you're looking at them. Okay, and do you see um, the butterfly there in the middle? Okay, the butterfly is gray matter, and then this would be what? You know? Yeah, this would be white matter. Okay, and this is referred to as gray matter. Now, the reason that is, is you have sensory neurons Sensory neurons come in the back of your spinal cord and their cell body is outside of it, okay? It comes in the back and then they can send out with an inner neuron that's going to go to your brain if need be. And then there's a motor neuron that comes out the front or comes out the front like this. Remember this person is laying face down like this. And so when you see this gray matter, it, the reason why it's gray is those are unmyelinated regions, and where it's white, that's where you have that myelin sheath that's protecting it, and that's why it appears white. Now, significance of this, wherever you have myelin sheath, that neuron is covered, and it makes it hard to do any, make a synapse. Remember just like how we have capillaries in the middle? That's the only place exchange can take place, because capillaries are what? One. One cell thick. So here in the unmyelinated regions is where all your synapses can occur. And the more synapses you have, possibly the better processing, better thinking that you're doing. So you want gray matter like in your brain. A lot of gray matter means lots of synapses, lots of connections. Okay? And um, again, this is on both sides. Sensory neurons come in the back. So if I take Andrew, which I've done a million experiments on, I'll just do a few more. If I take Andrew, Along the back of his spinal cord, I could go and cut just the sensory neurons along the back of his spinal cord and leave his motor neurons there. Then what would happen? Besides me going to jail. Besides that. <laughs> he wouldn't sense anything, but he could still what? Move. Yeah, do all this. But if I went around the front and started cutting his motor neurons and left his sensory neurons, then what? He could feel everything. Right, but he couldn't move. Okay, think about that oh. for a minute. Either <laughs> one's not very good. It's like, yeah, see, it's like and the, the thing is, I think they made some scary movies. What happens is these sensory neurons and these motor neurons, they join and make one nerve fiber coming off here. But the streets are going two different directions as it approaches um, the spinal cord. So when you look here, Okay, again, you're kind of, you can see that butterfly part, and you can see them coming in. So you have your sensory information coming in here in the back, and then the motor information coming out the front. And in the middle is what kind of neuron? Interneuron, good, okay? And again, you can see that here, sensory information coming in the back, interneurons, and then motor neurons coming out the front. And depending on where your injury is on your spinal cord is what you can control. If you like dive into a pool and end up snapping your spinal cord somewhere up in here, then you could end up being a quadriplegic. But if you do it a little bit lower, maybe you're just a paraplegic and you have control of your arms and legs. So depending on where the damage is in our spine depends on how much we have loss of motor control and sensation for that matter. All right, um, so let's put this in our notes. Um, on your structure, we have gray matter, white matter, and then the central canal is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. So right here is the central canal. And have you heard of spinal meningitis? That's when bacteria are in, is in that fluid growing. And that can cause big time problems. Okay, um, go to spinal cord structure underneath function. Reflex actions. 
sends sensory information to the brain, receives motor output, and tracks crossover. Left side of brain controls right side of body, etc. Yes. Um, the blank was under gray matter. It's a oh, cell. cell bodies. Yeah, sorry. Gray matter is cell bodies of motor neurons and inner neurons. Looks like a butterfly. Seems like a bee. Okay. So now let's look at the cerebrum. This is colored for you just to, to see um, different kind of regions. Um, I want you to see this whole, this whole thing right here, okay? All of this is your cerebrum. This is all higher thought. This is when I talk to you about your large mammalian brain, thinking, processing, memory, understanding, speech, language, um, all your cognitive abilities, that's all coming from that large cerebrum. Buried deep in here, okay, and you, you have things like your medulla oblongata and your thalamus and your hypothalamus, which are in charge of homeostasis, yeah. But on the outside here, and in the front, this is where you do um, send motor information away from your frontal lobes, and here at your parietal lobes, this is where you do your processing. Your occipital lobes, here is where you process vision, and um, we'll be talking about perception. Um, there's the idea you can sense things. That's one thing, you, you sense an image or a picture, but it's a different step to per what you perceive. You can think about it, you know those pictures where you look at it one way and it's like, oh, it's an old man, oh, it's two couples kissing. You know what I mean, when you look at those pictures? you're still sensing the same thing every time, the images that you're seeing, right? But what you're perceiving is what changes. You got that? Okay, have you ever misunderstood somebody who was talking to you, you perceived, and they're like, no, I wasn't angry, I wasn't mad. Well, then why did you text me in all caps, right? So we have ways we perceive and interpret things, maybe different, we're seeing letters, but I perceive that as yelling at me, okay? Um, so on your cerebrum, Sensory information integrates and sends motor response, communicates and coordinates the entire brain, communicates and coordinates the entire brain, sensation, reasoning, learning, memory, language, speech. Could you survive with a chunk out of your cerebrum? Yeah, for sure. These are, if you've ever seen anything or watched a movie where somebody got in a motorcycle accident or something and they have brain damage and they're just slower, maybe their personality's a little bit different, they don't process things as well. They're still alive and functioning, but they don't have their larger mammalian brain working with all the ores in the water, so to speak, right? They can't process as well as they did before. Now, um, if you look here, um, this is showing you um, some regions, again, frontal lobe, parietal lobe. You don't have to memorize all of that. But as far as your dedication of how much um, of your cerebrum is dedicated to different things, this is just cartoon drawings on the brain here. And this is for motor. So obviously, what do we care a lot about controlling? We have a lot of motor nerves dedicated to certain areas. So what looks to be important? Face, right? We're social organisms, we communicate with others. The face is really important, what else? The hand and the tongue. And then look at this, the throat part, right? Swallowing is super risky, you know? If any of you have ever choked on food or, you know, have blog, you know, you know, swallowing is like, there's a <clears throat> bunch of things that have to work out well to swallow so you don't, you know, suffocate yourself every time you swallow, right? So that's a good thing to control as well. Okay, and then this one shows you a cartoon image of what we dedicate to sensory and perceiving and processing information that comes in. Again, those lips seem to be really important, mm -hmm. and the hand is important, tongue, etc. And then obviously some of our organs, like that we're aware, oh, I'm full, I need to urinate, you know, the, all those types of things. Okay, now let's move in. Do not be terrified by this picture because you're not having to memorize all of these things, okay? This whole part, memory, learning, thought, higher um, mammalian brain. I want you to look at this region right here. There's a couple things you already know. This right here is the hypothalamus. What sits right below the hypothalamus? Pituitary, pituitary gland. And we call the pituitary the? 
master glands, right? Because it controls so many glands. And when we talk about maintaining homeostasis, there are two systems whose jobs, big deal about maintaining homeostasis. What are the two systems? Nervous and endocrine. They cross over right here. This is full on nervous tissue. This is full on endocrine tissue. So this is where those two meet to kind of help regulate your body. Uh, the hypo, hypo means below. Above it, this thing that kind of looks like a fried egg, that's your thalamus. Your thalamus has to do with s several different things, but one that's kind of interesting is memory and like smells. So if let's say you had a boyfriend or girlfriend and they always wore the same cologne or perfume and, and you broke up years ago and, and then you smell this perfume again and you're all, it's great. Okay, and all of a sudden memories flood back to some other time or something. There's a, like there's some like it's guava or papaya juice. I don't know which one it is, but when I have it, when I drink this juice, if I you know had it, all of a sudden I'm in fourth grade. I'm in Hawaii, you know, with my family. We had gone on this long hike. It was so beautiful, and at the top they gave us juice. I smell that. I swear to you, in a moment, I'm in fourth grade all over again with my mom, and I just went on this great hike. You know, and it's like I'm there in a nanosecond. That's your thalamus right there, bringing you back to those memories and you associate them with some sort of sense that you have. Okay, that's that part right there. So going in, just to focus on that, that's, we have the hypothalamus and the thalamus. So right here's the thalamus, here's the hypothalamus, and then dropping out of that is the pituitary gland. So underneath diencephalon, hypothalamus is all about this, one word, homeostasis. Regulates hunger, sleep, thirst, temp. And the hypothalamus is the link, is the link between the nervous system and the endocrine system by controlling the pituitary gland. Tell your bio buddy, is there one distinct emotion that you feel like you could share that you ever like that is a smell, maybe it's a cooking spice or something and it reminds you of your grandma? Yeah. Go ahead, tell your bio buddy. I, I said the candles smell like bed bath and beyond. Because there's a memory of bed bath and beyond. It's been a lot of time there. <laughs> Not really, but I just remember being really bored with my mom there. Like jumping on all the mattresses. I can still so <laughs> imagine. And then there's this like uh, memory foam one, and I didn't know it was like going to be really hard because like memory foam once you like hit it, it's hard, but then it like softens up. So I literally like, like, like really rattled around. And you have a good spot there. Yeah. 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 Y
And they had never met me before, and it was like a bunch of football moms. And there, and this one lady says to my friend, "She is really funny. What is she drinking?" And she's all, and I'm all, "It's iced tea, you know, with a little lemonade." But anyway, so I'm now nervous and goofy and dorky like I am. And he goes, "Have you been drinking?" I'm all, "Well, no, not really." I go, "But like, about I don't know, it was like four or five hours ago. I had a glass of wine, but there's nothing wrong with." It. So he's like, "Pull over," and I'm like, "Oh my gosh." So I pull over, I get out, do the full close your eyes, okay, and you know, and walk like a car full of my students. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm not married then, and so my name is, is at the time Miss Grasser. And so they are leaning out the door, you know, and, and going, and, and, Miss Grasser, yay! You know, and I'm over there like this, and I'm like, and the police officer's like, you're not drunk at all. I go, I know, you know. It was mortifying, you know, and I was like, whatever. Okay, so what they do, I know. I mean, what are the odds? A car full of my students are going through the checkpoint at that time, you know, and I'm just, yes? What was the class afterwards, like after that? I mean, look at, you know, you see me every day. You know exactly what I'm like. It's probably like that, but worse. I was in, I was like 23. <laughs> okay, so um, anyway, so then um, what they have you do is by closing your eyes and going like this, what happens with alcohol is it affects your cerebellum. So that's why people don't have the balance that they need and they can't walk the line because they can't coordinate their motor responses, okay? All right, so on cerebellum, integrates and pass on sensory and motor information, but it maintains normal muscle tone maintains normal muscle tone, posture, and balance, and coordinated movement. Muscle tone, balance, Sarah the ballerina. Okay, so when we think here, let's review this right here. This is your cerebrum, what is this all about? Higher order thinking, tell me some more. Motor, what else? Look at me, look at me, helping you now. Cerebrum, what is this about? Memory, okay, good. What is this right here? Hypothalamus. Okay, and it's a link between that and this right here is the pituitary gland, linked to the nervous. This right here is the thalamus. This right here, cerebellum, and that's all about balance. Good. All right, so now we're going to move to this region right here, okay, this, this innermost part of it. And so we're going to go into the brain stem. And the brain stem, okay, this looks like just a creepy picture, okay, do you see the thalamus? Okay, and this is your midbrain, this is the pons, here's something you know very well, it's right above your spinal cord. Spinal cord is all about reflex, taking information in and out, medulla oblongata, you know about this, this is your what? Heart rate, what else? Breathing rate, right? Um, vomiting, sneezing, all this kind of thing. Huh, bless you, medulla oblongata. So brainstem, medulla oblongata regulates breathing, heart rate, breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, vomiting, sneezing. And then the pawns in the midbrain above them, they kind of work, work alongside. Regulates breathing. There you go. All right. So now let's do limbic system. Now, the limbic system, it's it's a whole a whole but it's like everything that's highlighted there. You don't have to memorize all of those. It's just deep in the cerebrum and the surrounding diencephalon. Remember what your diencephalon was like hypothalamus, right? All in that region. And um, and it's involved in both memory, learning, fear, anger, and pleasure. Memory, learning, and fear, anger, and pleasure. Okay, you do not need to memorize the different kinds of memory. I just thought I'd show you, um, you know, that I'm just kind of exposing it to you there. On the memory is the ability to hold a thought in mind or recall events from the past. Um, how good are how good are you at memory? Do you struggle with memory? You think you're good at it? Tell your bio buddy on memorization. <laughs> now, look at the different.
different kinds of memory. So short term is like when somebody tells you a number, an address, and you're repeating it. You know, three three six four six eight three three six four six. You know, you're trying to repeat it. That's short term. So fast. Long term memory is numbers and words. Episodic memory is persons or events and skill memory. A lot of you know this from my Sporty Spice people, your skills, like your in, you, once you learn how to throw a ball or swing muscle a bat memory. or uh, you know, golf club or what, yes? They refer to as muscle memory. Yeah, a lot of times that's referred to as muscle memory. And then those of you who are Sporty Spice people, sometimes you, you start working on whatever it is you're doing and you overthink it and if you just relax and allow yourself to just do it, you'll do better. Some of you, I'm sure musicians are like that as well. You have memory about a song, you start to stress about it, then it changes everything. Um, so those are just different types, but language and speech, language is dependent on memory. Language is dependent on memory. And there are special centers in your left hemisphere help account for our ability to comprehend and use speech. There have been people who've had strokes and they can't respond with words like you and I talk, but they can sing and they sing their response because those are in different regions of their brain. Uh, yeah. all different. Okay, now the reticular activating um, center or reticular formation is all throughout your brain. This is not on your notes, but I wanna talk to you about it. I don't know if I talked about it in class. We'll go back to Andrew again, just cause it's right here. Um, this would be, and I'm sure you've experienced this, where you're not paying attention to your mother calling you or your father. So Andrew's mom could go, Andrew, Andrew's on the computer or something. Like his brain goes, dismissed, not important. Okay? <laughs> and then his mom writes, Andrew, like his brain example. decides for him. Not, I don't need to pay attention. It's fine. Andrew, dismissed. This game's really important. Then she goes, Andrew. And he responds, what? And she says, don't you yell at me. And he goes, you're yelling at me. We didn't know that. Drama. Okay? <laughs> so... Right? How accurate is that? <laughs> okay? And this is because your reticular formation says, I don't care, that's not important. It's really not elevating. It's kind of when I talk to you in class and I say, okay, discuss with your friends, now come back to me. And some of you go, not important. <laughs> I want to finish this conversation with my friend. Right? And I'm telling you, make me important, you know, so that I can redo the class. You experience this, if you're home and you're with your family, it's 9 or 10 o'clock at night and there are sounds, your brain all the time goes, not important, not important, perceives it, and then just dismiss it, swipe. <laughs> it's out, you swipe, not important. But you're home by yourself, and you hear a sound, you're like, what's that? Could that be? And then your brain goes to memories and emotions and fears, and your little lizard brain comes out. Danger, <laughs> okay, <laughs> paranoia. Okay, and the lizard starts to respond and it gets way stressed out and your mammalian brain sinks away, okay? And then people can do, like I can remember one time I just moved and I thought my bedroom light was on and I just moved in this new house, I had, nobody was home. I turned off the lights in the living room and I needed to go to my bedroom. Uh -oh. But there were, I thought my bedroom light was on but it wasn't, I turned off the light and I turned I'm all like, oh my gosh, there's no lights on. And then I heard a noise, and I got super stressed all of a sudden. And I thought, I need to get to the hallway and flip on that light. I, like, take off in a full run, okay? <laughs> Not even thinking with my large mammalian brain. There are walls, you know? <laughs> no, I'm my little lizard brain. I run, wham, into the, into the hallway wall, flat on my back. Now it's dark, I'm on my back, and I'm confused, you know? Like, now it's like, where's the light? You know, and I'm like reaching up, and I turn on the light, it's nothing. But a little lizard was reacting, making poor choices. So I say, stay out of your lizard brain, stay in your large mammalian brain. Your reticular formation, it will vary, okay? It will vary. All right, now, let's see. Take a look right here, I have a little diagram for you. <coughs> Oh yeah, what do you want to be today? Teachers. Teachers, okay. Whoa, I, I don't, are you, okay. There's gonna be names already in there, it's not coming up. Oh, I don't know if you can interact too much. What do you think the red one is? Do you get the picture? Oh yeah, there it goes, there we go. 
I wonder if it was just not engaged yet, maybe. If you have to hit on No, 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 no. I mean, it wasn't coming up right away. Punchy. Okay, I'm starting the activity. All right, is it coming up on your screen now? Yeah. Okay, so try and figure out, look at the part and try to think of it before you hit it. outside of your brain and spinal cord. Those are those 12 pairs of cranial nerves and those 31 pairs of spinal nerve. And remember, just a nerve is a bunch of long axons grouped together. Um, what is this white stuff right here? Myelin sheath. What does a myelin sheath do? Speeds it up, good. Okay, here you can see the brain and you can see the 12 pairs of um, cranial nerves. Some are sensory, some are motor, some are mixed. Number five right here says two eye muscles. Is that sensory, motor, or mixed? Two eye muscles. It's going to the eye. What would it be? Motor. Mm -hmm. This one, number eight, says from inner ear. Sensory. This one says from mouth and two jaw muscles. It says from mouth, coming from your mouth, and to the jaw muscles. It must be mixed. Okay, so that particular nerve fiber has pathways coming in and out to the brain from there. If this one says two eye muscles, that would be what? Motor. Okay, so those are your, um, those are your cranial nerves, and then your spinal nerves are coming off. You have 31 pairs coming off there. They are all mixed. When you look at a cross section, you see the butterfly. Then you can see your vertebrae surrounding it. You, and this person would be facing down. This bone right here would be these bony protrusions right here. Sensory fibers are coming in, synapsing here, and then motor fibers are coming out. So it's going this way and oh, ah, 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 and that way. Okay, so it's going both directions when you grab the nerve itself, but they split off right at the spinal cord. Um, this is a really good diagram. And I have gone over this with you before, right? When I when the chart where it was orange and yellow. So not it. Not it. Okay. Um, somebody needs to take the left half and somebody needs to take the right. So decide who's doing what and go. All right, so this would be a good picture because it's a nice overview. If you don't have this picture, I would grab it, okay? So somatic is about choice. Autonomic, you don't have to think about it. Sympathetic, Iris, remember this. Sympathetic, you feel sympathy for somebody in stress. 
okay? This would be more attuned to part of like the fight or flight reaction, um, exercise, working out, and then parasympathetic or chillaxing, okay? Um, here you can see again, you got pinprick. This is gonna show you a reflex. Sensory information comes in, synapse inner neuron, motor neuron back out, and you can withdraw from that pin. I probably talked to you about it before in a previous class. If you accidentally touched a hot pan, sensory neurons coming up, synapsing with an inner neuron to your brain, simultaneously with a motor neuron to your hand. So you're pulling your hand away, and oftentimes then you like pull your hand away and then go hot, okay? But you're sensing, perceiving it at, you've already pulled your hand away, and that would be a very protective response. Um, oldest bio, buddy, explain this, please. All right, so on 17.4, and I don't know why they make his hand go like that, because then he would be like jamming the pin into his hand. But, <laughs> pin? <laughs> okay. Um, so the peripheral nervous system is outside the central nervous system but attached to it. Somatic system and the reflex arc, the target is the skeletal muscles. It consists of sensory neurons going towards and motor going away. The reflex pathway, this is where you need to add in your notes. Little letter A, you have a stimulus. B, you have those sensory receptors, neurons coming in. C, interneurons of the spinal cord interneurons, D, motor neurons exit, and then E, skeletal muscles contract. Whereas your autonomic system, the introduction, it's involuntary, involuntary, control of smooth muscles of the internal organs, glands, and cardiac muscle, the sympathetic division is your what response? Starts with an S. Stress, Stress response. Parasympathetic is relaxation. Yes. Sympathetic is stress. So, just so you have more ideas about what that means, look up here. Guys, you gotta stop. Parasympathetic and sympathetic. Okay. So if you look over here, I already gave you this example. Sympathetic would accelerate the heartbeat, um, parasympathetic slow it down. Sympathetic, you dilate your bronchi so you get even more air for whatever you're dealing with, and this one constrict your bronchi. Inhibits digestion, stimulates digestion, okay? So you have nerves coming out of different regions of your spinal cord that are in charge of either accelerating to respond and then stopping to waste that. You know, you don't want to spend energy doing that if you don't need it. So that's when the parasympathetic would come back in. All right, and then this takes us to, oh, here. Takes us right here. You can do some dogs. <coughs> Guys, I'm gonna encourage you again right now, sign up for the SAT2 in biology, okay? There's a May test date and there's a June test date. You wanna accrue SAT2 scores, you will do a, do a great job on your SAT2 as a result of being in this class. Um, there are two divisions of it. There is an E and an M test, E for ecology, M for molecular. You don't have to decide until the day of which one you wanna take. And you actually can, the first part of the test, everybody takes, and then it divides in the back into the E and the M test. Look through, they're the, both there. See what one you feel most comfortable on, take that test, okay? That for your second half. It takes like about an hour, I think, even to take it. 
And then you can take SAT twos in math, you can take SAT twos in history, and it's basically, basically a standardized test that can be used to compare you with other children. The more of them you take and pass, the better off you are. And you can definitely, and I think it's like 40 bucks, and you can do it through the student store. You can take them locally. At their, we don't offer the SAT two here to, to, to give, but it's like Agora and Westlake. And the longer you wait to sign up for it, the fewer your options, because you choose a testing location. Okay, so either the May or the June test date, I would do. Yes? Why don't you do bad on it, then does that mean? No, you don't have to record any oh. scores you don't like. And you won't do bad on it. Okay. All my students do a great job. And then say, Miss Litton, I did great. And I go, I know. Like that. You'll do fine. All right, so, darn it. Look at some, don't use the Lord's name in vain. Look at the screen, okay, and see, does your bio buddy need, oh, is it Caleb? Um, the autonomic system has two divisions, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Somatic and skeletal, no. no. Oh, somatic is to skeletal as autonomic is to, and yes, cardiac smooth and all your glands. Because autonomic makes your heart beat, right, your glands, and any smooth muscle. All right, last topic. This one, I am betting you feel fairly comfortable with, because you've talked about this last year in health, yes? I mean, I don't want you to be comfortable with drugs, but you know. So, um, drugs um, can affect your body's functions. And um, most of drugs um, interact with receptor sites on cells, usually ones for neurotransmitters, right? You have a receptor in the postsynaptic neuron, and that's where drugs impact. It's a chemical interacting in that synapse zone. Okay, um, and you can look here, drugs and the nervous system, they can make you have leaky neurotransmitters, so they come out a little too generously, promote the release of it, block an enzyme that breaks it down, block reabsorption of it, block the receptor site, that's what drugs do. If you don't want to feel pain, let's block the receptors, right, that would detect pain. Like if you were gonna go into surgery and they're gonna cut you open in your abdomen, you don't wanna feel that, right? So let's block that sensation. So, um, so on, um, they promote or prevent the actions of the neurotransmitter and they impact the limbic system. Impact the limbic system. Okay, physical dependence and addiction um, I would like Blue to explain what physical dependence and addiction is. Go ahead. Okay, now come back to me. Just like your endocrine system, just like your endocrine system, if you give yourself a chemical that your body is supposed to produce in some regulated manner, and you are giving yourself that chemical, taking some pill, and you're getting that chemical to be released, or, or sorry, you're providing it yourself, so your body's not releasing it, not regulating it, your body will go, oh my gosh, this chemical's on the rise. What do we do when one chemical's high? We exert what kind of feedback? Negative, Negative feedback. So we will shut down the glands that secrete that. Okay, because we will we'll go back in our endocrine system and say, oh, we have plenty of this and we'll shut it down. So then it won't make it anymore, right? And when it doesn't make it anymore, the only way we can have it is participating with that drug. It's the same thing here with your nervous system. If you're putting a chemical into your body that your body normally releases, you know, like endorphins and things like when you've worked out and you're putting something in there and overriding it or dopamine, okay, a neurotransmitter in your brain, then your brain stops secreting it, stops releasing it, and the only way you get that high, that feeling, is if you do or participate in that drug. Okay, so let's look just real quickly at a few of them. And one of them is alcohol. And after caffeine, it is the most socially accepted drug. And it is a, do you remember what it is? A depressant. Yeah, it's a depressant. 
Okay. And um, so it kind of slows down the activities of the central nervous system. Some people you'll see teenagers, they say, oh, I can only have fun if I take the alcohol because it moves you out of your large mammalian brain and down into that, what was that brain I told you about? Lizard, lizard brain. brain. And the lizard, is, lizard brain is less inhibited by social norms. So they go, I wanna remove my mammalian brain and thinking and my insecurities, and now I'll work out of my lizard brain and make decisions there. Who usually makes be better decisions, mammals or lizards? Mammals. Mammals, okay, so think about that. Um, nicotine. Um, nicotine is um, initially a stimulant, triggering dopamine release. Obviously, there's a few um, diseases associated with nicotine. Um, designer drugs like bath salts, people are manufacturing. It's not like there's any company regulating these, so what you can end up is making these concoctions that can destroy you, right? Um, because it's not like the FDA is like, oh, you haven't cooked that meth appropriately, right? There's nobody regulating that. And so people get exposed and serious brain damage. I, I don't know why you would risk it. You know, you, you guys are all so bright and smart and wonderful. Don't do that stuff, okay? Um, so designer drugs um, act as a stimulant, but can be linked to full-on lizard brain, paranoia, violent behavior, hallucinations. Um, date rape drugs. And these have sedative effects. Girls, listen to me, because I'm not worried about guys, because guys generally are not gonna get date rape because they have to have an erection to be functional and in that kind of capacity, but girls don't, right? So girls, never, ever, 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 ever take a drink from somebody that you didn't see get poured straight out of a bottle. You, are you with me on that? When you're 21. Never, never, never accept a red cup of alcohol. Okay, ever, okay? If you are 21 and you're choosing to drink, you better know what's in that. I don't care if it's soda. They say, oh, it's just Coke, you know, or something like that. Don't take that, okay? Because you don't know what could be in that. And then you're like, oh, you're not feeling good? Here, let me help. You want to go outside for a little bit? Okay, let's go outside. Mm. Okay, no. Um, cocaine and crack, um, I don't want you to do those either, okay? Um, so it's a stimulant initially and then a crash. Heroin is actually on the rise. Um, but I don't want you to do that either. Um, and people, more and more people are going back to heroin to use as a drug, hideous drug, because the problem is at first, I guess, I don't know, because I haven't done this, you know, but at first it gives you a tremendous high of some sort of like wonderful feeling, but it takes very little before you only can feel that if you have the drug, and then pretty soon, it, the drug doesn't give you the high anymore because your body is all about homeostasis and it's like, oh wait, this is too much, so let's lower it. You have to take heroin just not to have the withdrawal effects, okay? And so you're not, it's not like you're feeling good anymore, you're just trying not to feel like crap anymore. You know, terrible withdrawal symptoms, so you have to have the drug just to avoid that. Um, okay, and then there's marijuana and um, spice is like a chemical that's concocted, it's like a cooked, that you put on top of an herb, again, not well regulated, you don't know what could happen to you on that. Um, I don't recommend it. Look at number eight in your notes. It says, be prepared to answer this question on your next exam. Instead of don't do drugs, based on the biological information, what we've learned about our endocrine system, right, and our nervous system, what could you tell a friend considering using and abusing any of the drugs above? Make it meaningful to you so that you will be able to remember it. What would you tell somebody if you were trying to talk to them logically about the use of drugs? What would you say to them, other than don't do drugs? Okay. Um, I know we'll do this in the review because um, we don't. I don't think we have time for it. We have two minutes. We have two minutes. I know because it's ironic. I have flowers, a little bee, date rape, you know, over here. This I'm like, okay, uh, I should have picked a different one. Um, Okay, so um, then I gave you all the diseases below about Alzheimer and dementia, um, Parkinson's disease, loss of motor control, um, multiple sclerosis, um, um, autoimmune disease where you attack the myelin sheets. We've talked about a stroke before and meningitis is inflammation of the meninges. Do you want this while you're waiting, or you, we'll do it in the review? Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, there we go. All right. Super smart. <laughs> yeah, put those together. We'll do those, yeah. No, I didn't want to take the time. Have some toast.